Ephesians 2, verses 11 through 22. Therefore, remember that at one time, you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For He Himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in His flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances, that He might create in Himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, But you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure is being joined together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place by God, for God, by the Spirit. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you that that uh, you, you, you continually, you are faithful to your word. You sanctify us in your word. You, you save us because of your word. Lord, and I pray today that as we look to Ephesians chapter 2, your word, that you would help, help me to speak uh, your word boldly, to, to, to be clear. Uh, give everyone in this place, Lord, today I pray ears to hear what your word is saying and above all, Lord, may you be glorified in it as, as we see the union that we have in you, Jesus. And as you call us to a greater union, as you call us to, to uh, a true unity that is, that is by the Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. This is about the church. This is about God's house, his household, right? Uh, that we make up, right? We, we are, it says, members of the household of God if we are in Christ. So, so we're, that's where Paul's going, He's showing us the church, the household of God, right? The, a family, a unit. But there's a division that's being dealt with here that Christ broke. There is no division. Christ broke it down in his flesh. Right. But there, there's still there's still uh, not harmony between Jew and Gentile in many cases. And he's addressing this situation. And that's what we see today. I don't know if you have kids. I got two little knuckleheads over there. And, and uh, uh, it's it's something else when they're fighting and not getting along and not acting like brothers. See David turning and looking at his boys. Check. Right? There's times where they're, they're not acting as they ought, like they're brothers, like they're of the same household, right? And it's, as a father, that's, that's, not, that's not good, right? It, it, it's grieving to see your boys um, act in such a way. And, and, you know, disunity among God's people has always been... I guess, in a sense, a heartache for God, right? Disunity because of what Christ has done, the cost that, that purchased the unity that we have with one another. As I mentioned, in verses 1 through 10, we sell our unity with Christ. And in 11 through 22, we see our unity in Christ, right? We are united to Christ and to one another because we are at one in Him, right? Uh, and in the same way, I don't want to see my children fighting with one another, right? Jesus prays for our unity in John 17. <clears throat> in uh, 
Four times he mentions our unity. In verse 11, he says, he, Jesus is praying to the Father before he goes to the cross. Right? If you want to hear Jesus pray, you, you should read John 17 often. It's amazing. Uh, the high priestly prayer of Jesus. What a blessing that we have it in written form. Jesus praying for literally us. He says, and I am no longer in the world in verse 11 of John 17. I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world. That's Christ's people, right? And I am coming to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. Down in verse 21, he says, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, even as we are one. In them, I in them, and you in me, that they may become perfectly one, perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me, and I love them even as you loved me. Right? Jesus prayed for the unity that we would have. And Paul is dressing, addressing the unity of the church, of the household of God in this text before us today. Positionally, we are one in Christ, right? Uh, 1 Corinthians 6, 17 says, but he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him, right? 1 Corinthians 12, 12 and 13 says, for just as the body is one and has many members, okay, in Ephesians 2 here, we see the church uh, represented as, as a household, as a building that God is building. Here in 1 Corinthians 12, we see the body of Christ expressed as a, as a functional body with many members, right? He says, for just as the body is one and has many members and all the members are of the body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit, we are, we're all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free and all were made to drink of one spirit. Now, the problem in this day was that of the Jew and the Gentile, right? You have, uh, you have the story of God throughout the Old Testament, the history of the world being told, right? And God was God to a particular people. We talked about this last week, right? Through the covenant of Abraham, that God had selected a people and it was through birthright, right? It was through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And if you were in the family, if you had the bloodline, if you were an ethical, ethnical Jew, you were considered God's people, right? Everybody else was outside of the covenant. Everybody else, as we saw and in, in, as we see here in verse 12, was remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenant of promise, without hope and without God in the world. Now, through the cross, Christ has demolished that. Now all can come to Christ by faith, right? Uh, and so, and so, now you have this group of people, these Jews, who used to have all these laws and, 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 and things to abide by and do, and you have the Gentiles who know nothing about that because it's not their custom, right? And so there's, there's some conflict, right, in, in the church because of Jew and Gentile and traditions and, and customs. Not only that, but if you, in, in 1 Corinthians 12, we also see that between slave and free, Right, slaves were uh, looked down upon in that day. They were purchased. Right, they they were subhuman in, in the mind of of people who were not slaves, who were who were slave owners. Right, and so what happens when the slave is redeemed in Christ? Now you have an issue because you are one spirit with somebody who you once looked down upon. In Christ, we are one new man. Whether you are a slave or free, whether you are Jew or Gentile, and this is what Paul's addressing in this scripture, right? Just as a physical body has a common principle of life flowing through it, right? We, we have life flowing through us if we are alive, right? So does the body of Christ, his church, right? The Spirit of God puts the life of God in the soul of every person who trusts in Jesus Christ and unites that believer in the same eternal realm. 
Right? In the kingdom of Jesus, all barriers come down. In the kingdom of Jesus, all barriers come down. In Him, there are no walls. No classes of people. There are no races. There's no gender. No distinctions of any sort. In Christ, we are one new man, is what he is saying in the text before us today. Um, Practically speaking, it often seems much different, right? Paul had to rebuke the believers in Corinth in the first chapter of 1 Corinthians. He, 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 uh, he rebukes them because there's quarreling among them, right? Um, and then again, in, in 1 Corinthians 3, he does the same thing. Listen to this in verses 1 through 3 of 1 Corinthians 3. But I, brothers, could not address you as spiritual people. Ouch. But as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ, I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. And even now you are not yet ready, for you are still of the flesh. For while uh, there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving only in a human way? Verse 19 says that We are members of the household of God. If we are in Christ, we are members of the household of God. And we're going to look at that in the end of this. Right. Uh, There's a saying that blood is thicker than water, and I'm pretty sure it's used wrongly. Ninety nine point nine nine percent of the time, because water has to do with birth, the birth canal. Blood has to do with covenant in ancient times. When a covenant was made, a cut was made across the hand between two authoritative parties, and they would lock hands as though my blood is flowing into you and your blood is flowing into me. That was the idea. Blood truly is thicker than water, right? And it is by the blood of Christ that the far off have been brought near, right? We are a family through the blood of Christ. Christ has purchased us if we are united to christ we also are united to one another and that's the main point of this text is that we are united to one another if we be in christ this is about church unity right so just just a reminder uh, of where we've come right um in chapter one we see the rich spiritual blessings of being in christ in chapter two we see that that we didn't start out that way and you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked right we were following the course of this world uh, we were of a different spirit we were of the spirit of the prince of the of the, the air right of satan we were under his influence but verse four says but god being rich in mercy the gospel comes to us Right, it is the gospel that penetrates the heart. It is the gospel that has the power to save us when we see our sin, that we are dead, and that we need to be made alive. We need something outside of ourselves to rescue us because we can't stand before God. We're not righteous, but Christ is and grants righteousness to those who believe by faith. Right, salvation we learned in verse 8 and 9 is by grace through faith. Right. God gives the grace. God gives the faith and we exercise that faith. Right. It's by grace through faith. And this is not of your own doing. It's a gift of God so that no man may boast. It's the work of Christ. It's the work of God who grants us eternal life for his workmanship, we learn. And 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 so now we're looking at the, the church. Right. That's how God that's how God worked in the individual. And now we look We're looking at the the church, the body of Christ, the household of God that we see in verses 19 through 22. And and there's an issue, right? And it's division. It's uh, it's it's division. Right. And so the direction I would have us to go this morning as we look at this, um, because there is no division in Christ, is that right in Christ, there is no division. In Christ, there is no division. And we see that in verses 11 through 14. In 15 through uh, 18, we see that in Christ, there is peace. And in verse 19 through 22, in Christ, we are being built together. Right? So there is no division. There is peace. And we are being joined and built together into a dwelling place 
for God. Let's look at verse 11 through 14. He says, Therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. So we talked about this a couple weeks ago. There's a distinction. Again, at one time, we were alienated, cut off, right? Uh, The ethnic... I can't get that word right. The Jews, right? We're the people of God and no other. But God has done a new thing. He has grafted the Gentile in by faith, right? God has done a new thing. There was a distinction. It says in verse 12, remember that you at that time, which at that time was before the work of Christ that has uh, ransomed us and made available to the Gentile grace by faith. Remember that at that time you were separated from Christ. Separated from Christ. Separated from Christ. Alienated from the commonwealth of Israel. You didn't have the blessing of God. Right? And strangers to the covenants of promise. That's why there was no hope for you. There was no promise for you. It's amazing to me, like, one of the biggest ideologies concerning the afterlife is people believe that we're born, we bounce around, and everything's meaningless and purposeless, and we die, and it goes dark, and that's the end of it. And I can see where they get that when you were once alienated, separated, without promise, and having no hope, and without God in the world. I could see where you come to that ideology. Right? But now, I love this again. You know, we, we heard the bad news in verse 1 through 3 of chapter 2 that you were dead in your sins. And in verse 4, we heard the good news, but God being rich in mercy. And it's kind of laid out the same here as he's addressing this division. You were once alienated, you were once separated. You know, you were without God in the world. You were without hope. But now, in Christ Jesus, right? You who were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. You had no access to God before the work of Christ. You could not come near where God dwelt in His temple. You weren't allowed you would desecrate it because you were unholy, because you were not His people. Right? But now, in Christ Jesus, the far off, those who couldn't come past the dividing line in the temple have now been brought near to where God is. By the blood of Christ. By the blood of Christ. That that is to say that there is nothing you can do to please God. There is nothing that you can do to, 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 to be righteous before God. You can try and try and try. You're a sinner. You're not perfect. And that is what's required. Christ was perfect. Christ was a sufficient sacrifice. His blood was enough to bring those who were far off near. And we have been grafted in. We have been grafted in. For He Himself is our peace. It says, right? Peace. uh, This is referring to peace between individuals. This is harmony. Uh, Perhaps, I don't know if you've ever heard some, uh, a group of people singing and there's a person out of key. It's quite obvious. It doesn't sound real good, right? Um, I think I did that once. (laughs) Right? It's, 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 I hit wrong notes all the time on the guitar. It could be the same. I'm not in harmony, right? We're not, there's not perfect harmony. There's not peace. For He Himself, that is the Lord Jesus Christ, is our peace. Right? He has brought harmony between Jew and Gentile. He has brought peace between Jew and Gentile. They're one new man. Right? Um, They both must look to Christ. They both must look to Christ. Right? So both is referring here. He has made us both one, both Jew and Gentile. Right? Again, the dividing wall was 613 laws. The Jews... We're trying to follow and the Gentiles were not. Right? The, the, uh, uh, and and we will look at how specifically this dividing wall was broken down in just a moment, but do notice it is in His flesh. He has broken it down in His flesh. Christ has fulfilled all these 
laws. By his blood, the far off were brought near, and in his flesh, the dividing wall that separated God's people from everybody else was broken down. And now all have access through Christ. All who come to faith are grafted in. That's good news. We once didn't have access to that. But because of Christ, we now have access to the throne of grace. Jesus says in in, in John 14, 6, that I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. That is true of the Gentile. That is also true of the Jew. It's it's no longer by birthright. It's it's not, not that it ever was. It was always by faith, right? It was always by faith. But now they must come through Jesus. You know, there's no more keeping of the law to be right with God because Christ filled it up. Now you must believe in Christ, Jew. Gentile, the only way to come to God is through Christ because He filled it up, right? We are one new man in Christ. We have access to God through Christ. All must come through Christ. In Christ, there is no division. There is no division. Right. You stand before God even now in one of two ways in your righteousness, which is damned. We talked about that this morning or clothed in Christ righteousness because of the gracious gift that he gives. Right. That's that's. The good news is that we all deserve hell. Right. We were all Ephesians one or chapter 2, 1 through 3 at one time. We were all uh, Ephesians 2, verse 12 at one time. But God, being rich in mercy, has delivered the gospel to us through the word of, of, of men, and the Spirit made us alive, right? By the blood of Christ, we, we recognize that we are sinful and that we can't come to God that we can't be right with God, that we can't meet the demands that God sets forth. It's not possible. And so we look to Christ who has, seeing that we are sinful. We come to Christ pleading for forgiveness, right? And He grants us faith. He grants us His righteousness. That's the good news of the Gospel. Ephesians 4 1-6 1-6 through 6 says, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. We should be eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace that we have in Christ. Right? Us, Jew and Gentile, and us. Right? We should be eager for the unity of the Spirit and bond of peace, there is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. There is no division in Christ. Which... Sounds funny, and we kind of talked about it this morning when you think about, well, what about that church down the street? (laughs) What about this church or that church or that church? They seem divided. Right? All I can say to that is we've been through a lot of churches. I'm sure many of us, there are many false churches. Many false churches. Jude warns about it, doesn't he? I was... I was going to write to you about our common salvations, brother, but instead, I feel I must write to you calling you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. Because there are people, evil men who have crept in unnoticed, and they're preaching a different gospel. They're preaching falsehood. That's happened ever since, right? It may seem there's division, but there's not. We are one body. We are one house. Right. Uh, There are churches that that have the gospel right and and have doctrines built upon philosophies of men. There's all kinds of churches. But if we are in Christ through the work of the gospel, through the work of Christ, we are one. We are one. Right. Uh, We desire here to preach and to teach directly from the scriptures, to compare scripture with scripture, not bring outside ideas into scripture to proclaim to you. 
That's dangerous, and that's why we have some rather strange denominations. I don't even like that word. Denama comes from the lower half of a fraction and means to cut in number. There is no division in Christ. There is one church, right? There is one church. We are, there is no division in Christ, only distinction, right? We are distinctly His when His Spirit produces in us the fruitfulness that the Spirit brings, right? We are one in Him. We are distinct, though there is no division. I talked about that last week. The Christian is distinct. Just as the Jews were distinct in the Old Testament, right? They, they, they had certain dietary laws. They looked different, right? They were distinct from everybody else. So as believers now, the work that the Spirit does in us makes us distinct. We don't look like the world. We don't talk like the world. We don't act like the world. We don't conduct our homes like the world. We're different, right? Because of the work of the Spirit. But there is no division in Christ, there is no division, right? Also in Christ, there is, we have peace. Verse 15 through 18 says, talking about the dividing wall of hostility, right? It, is, it, is, it has been broken down in his flesh. He's done so by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who are far off and peace to those who were near, for through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. How has Christ in his flesh broken down the dividing wall? By abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances, right? MacArthur writes, Through his death, Christ abolished Old Testament ceremonial laws, feasts, and sacrifices, which uniquely separated Jews from Gentiles. Right? He did not abolish the moral law, the Ten Commandments, as I've heard people use this text to say, he abolished the law. That's not what it's talking about here. It's specific, expressed in ordinances. Right? Uh, it's expressed in ordinances, right? This, these are, this is referring to ceremonial laws. In Hebrew, they were called uh, hukum and chuga, I think is how you pronounce it, which literally means custom of the nations. This was their customs. This was their ceremonial laws. Uh, uh, it's translated also statutes, right? These laws focus uh, the inherent tension on God. They include instructions on regaining right standing with God, right? So if you have sinned in the Old Covenant, in the Old Testament, right, that there are certain ceremonies, there are certain sacrifices that are be made for certain sins, for certain things, right? There were, these were expressed in ordinances. They make you right, to be made right with God, there was a sacrifice to be made. There was a, 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 a ceremony to be, kept for uncleanliness, right? Um, these ex these uh, ordinances have to do with remembrances of God's work in Israel. Um, feasts and festivals, right? So these, this is what he's talking about. These feasts, these festivals, specific regulations meant to distinguish Israelites from their pagan neighbors, right? Such as dietary and clothing restrictions, as I said earlier. And signs that point to the coming Messiah, circumcision and Passover. All these have been fulfilled in Christ's work, right? What is it that both the Jew and Gentile need to understand concerning what Paul is saying here? It's that there's nothing left to do. Christ has done it. If you're a Jew, Christ has fulfilled all these laws. There is no more need for a sacrifice he is the once for all sacrifice. There is no need for a ceremony that points to the coming Messiah because he is the coming Messiah who fulfilled all that God desired for him to fulfill. There's nothing left. Nothing left but faith. Nothing left but faith in Christ, right? Hebrews 7, 27 says, He has no need like those high priests to offer sacrifices daily for his own sins, and then for those of the people, since he did this once for all when he offered up himself. Jesus was the final once for all sacrifice. And so all these laws of, in, of, the, of these commandments expressed in ordinances have been fulfilled in Christ. 
There is no more dividing wall in that regard. There is no more dividing wall. He has, through the cross, killed this hostility that still existed in the church, right? Between Jew and Gentile. He's killed it by filling up the law. And he came, verse 17, and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to you who were near. I missed one. And might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross. Right? To reconcile, is to bring back to one's original state in a sense, or to bring into agreement our harmony, make compatible or consistent. Right? He has reconciled us both to God, both Jew and Gentile. He has brought us in again to harmony, in, in, into, into agreement, into being compatible with one another. There is no more Jew and Gentile. Right? Colossians 1.22 says, He has now reconciled in His body of flesh by His death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before Him. Right? He has reconciled in his body of flesh. He, by the, through the cross, he has killed the hostility. Amen. And he came and preached peace to you who are far off and peace to those who were near. First time he came preaching peace, the next time he will come ruling with justice. Right? But he came preaching peace. He came to those who were far that's the Gentile. He came to those preaching peace to those who were near. That is the Jew. Right? For through him, we both, Jew and Gentile, have access in one spirit to the Father. One spirit, the Holy Spirit whom Jesus promised to send, right? Who identified the church in Acts chapter 2. If you remember, the Holy Spirit, when it descended, when it came, when Je the Spirit whom Jesus had promised, when it came on the day of Pentecost, identified the believers with visual, visual red tongues that appeared to be on fire, right? It identified the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Spirit identifies the church, they, uh, whom the Spirit applies the salvation that God gives in John chapter 3. Right? It's talking about the wind referring to the Spirit. No one knows where it comes from or where it went, but it is the Spirit that causes us to be born again to a living hope, that delivers the grace and faith that Christ has given. It's by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, according to Ephesians 2, 8, 9, the Spirit whom has come into the world to convict the world concerning sin, righteousness, and judgment in John chapter 16. Right? It is the Spirit that makes us alive. Right? We are of one Spirit. In one Spirit, we have access to God through Jesus Christ. We are reconciled in one body through the cross. The once for all sacrifice of Jesus was the only sacrifice that is able to take away sin for both Jew and Gentile alike. The Jew and Gentile dividing wall no longer exists. We are one new man. There is only one church. In Christ there is peace. No more accusing one another. Christ has fulfilled all in all. Right? We are one body. 1 Corinthians 1.10 says, I appeal to you, brothers, uh, I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree, and that there are no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. Right? Because of the peace Christ purchased with His blood, there should be no division among us. Right? Paul's appealing to him, to, to the church in Corinth here, to allow there to be no division among you. Right? We are to have peace with one another in Christ. Now, I know, you know, we, it's, we have some personality conflicts amongst us. Right? We have some... Some people might get on your nerves. You might be more friendly with others than some. You may be closer to some than others. But there must be peace between us. We have peace because of Christ, right? And we learn to get over those things, right? Because Christ is what unites us. If, 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 if Christ is our peace, 
But if we are united in Christ, we are united in one another because you are united in Christ. I am united in Christ. Therefore, we are united in one another. And, and, and they are fighting in Corinth, right, in disagreement. And he's saying, let there be no division among you, brothers. Squash it. Right? Sometimes we need to do that. I, I, there's great fellowship here, praise God. Right? Uh, but that's, that's uh, there are differences. We have differences. Right? We are one church. We are united in Christ. In Christ, we have peace. Right? No more hatred towards one another. No more hostility. But perfect peace because of Christ. Even if, even if we're not uh, two peas in a pod, even if we have our differences in this world, in the flesh, uh, we have peace in Christ. Republicans and Democrats can go to church together. Right? In Christ, we have peace. In Christ, we are being built together. And I love this imagery. Listen to this, 19 through 22. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure is being joined together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. We are members of the household of God. If we are in Christ, that's, that's mind-boggling. We were once alienated, right? We were once alienated. Uh, those who have been reconciled through the blood of Christ are now members of God's family. Remember Ephesians 1.5? He predestined us for adoption to Himself as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of His will. If you are in Christ, you have been adopted. Legally. You're God's. He is your Father. You belong in His house. Right? Right? You are of the household. You are a member of the household. Uh, as my sons are members of my household, so your children are members of your household, so we are members of God's household, Christ's church. Built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. It's not just any church. It's not just any household. It's a specific household. It's a specific church. It's a specific building being built, and it's being built upon a foundation that is the apostles and prophets. The prophets spoke of the coming Messiah. The prophets were looking forward to Christ who would make right what Adam made wrong, who would redeem us from our sin. There's a specific foundation, and it's that of the uh, uh, prophets and of the apostles. Listen to 1 Corinthians 3. 10 and 11, according to the grace of God given to me, Paul says, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation. And someone else is building up on it. Let each one take care how he builds upon it, for no one can lay a foundation on other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Right, The foundation that, that Christ is building his church upon, that he is building us upon the household that we belong to has a foundation of a promise of Christ who would come, Christ who came, and apostles who walked with Him on this earth, right? Uh, disciples who were with Him every day, day in and day out for three years whom He poured into. Well, we mentioned in Sunday school this morning, right? There was a prerequisite to be an apostle. These men walked with Christ. These men, as promised... We're filled with the Spirit to remember all that Jesus had spoken, to bring to remembrance all these accounts that we see in the New Testament, right? And to lead them as they would write. We talked about that in Sunday school this morning too. Men who by the Holy Spirit wrote. And so it is built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Revelation 21, uh, we see the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven. There are 12 gates. Each gate has the name of, of uh, the 12 tribes of Israel. And on the foundation stones, the 12 stones are written the name of the apostles. Right? Even there we see the apostles. 
So we are members of the household of God. We are built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. I like this. I, I, uh, I have a grandpa, had a grandpa, and two uncles that were bricklayers. And in the, in the summertime, I got shipped off a couple times to go do some manual labor and uh, to learn some things. And uh, uh, I did get to learn about bricklaying. Uh, don't ask me to come brick anything for you. That was a long time ago, and it will look horrible. Um, but it's fascinating what goes into it, right? And, and, and when you are building a building, whether it's from my, actually I have a brother that lays stone. Um, when you start a building, you need a firm foundation, right? You need a solid foundation that can hold up the building. That's why we have footers and these foundation stones. But the most important stone is the first laid stone that every other stone in the whole building will be built off of. Right? A cornerstone was the first laid stone that every other stone would align itself to. Right? You don't start building a wall in the center of the wall. It's going to be crooked. No telling where it's going to wind up. And it's not a good point of reference. You start in the corner. Right? Jesus is the cornerstone that all must be aligned to. Right? It's a foundation stone. There's the foundation and there's the foundational stone, the stone by which everything looks to, points to, and focuses on. 1 Peter 2, starting in verse 4 says, As you come to Him, and listen to the parallel, listen to the agreement between Peter and Paul, right? Two apostles who are saying similar things and see the Spirit at work in these brothers as we hear the Word. As you come to Him, a living stone, rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious. You yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture... Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So, the honor is for you who believe, but before those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, right? The Jews rejected their Messiah, and now he has become the cornerstone. Right? A stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people. Right? That was Ephesians 2 verse 12. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. I love this picture. In whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In whom you also are being, you also, if you are in Christ, are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. I love how Peter calls us living stones. Right? The foundation is the apostles and prophets. Christ is the cornerstone. And we're talking about a building that is being constructed. It is though we are a stone in the building that Christ has placed, mortared in place. And we're being stacked up, built up from the time the Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost until the day Jesus receives His church in the clouds to be with Him. We are stones being set into the dwelling place that God will dwell. We are members of the household of God. His children. Not only that, we are His dwelling place. 
right? Our body is the temple of the spirit that lives within us. We being built together, his church, past, present and future to this local gathering. We are being joined together. We are being joined together. The building up uh, and building together is being witnessed even right now among us, isn't it? I mean, I can see it, but, you know, James and I have been here for a long time. (laughs) Many of you have, though, and you've seen the change, right? You've seen how God has taken gifts and abilities of members and, and, and has worked them together, and He's doing something. He's building something. He's building His church, right? You count for something in Christ's kingdom. You count in this local church. We need one another's time, talent, treasure, love, resources, encouragement, rebuke. We are to live the Christian life together, right? Centered in Christ, rooted in the teaching of Scripture, right? Christ desires a people joined together, not lone Christians. And I, this speaks directly to that. And I'm, I'm speaking to myself about 12 or 13 years ago. So I've been there. There are no lone Christians. It doesn't work. Right? To, to act a lone Christian and be separated from the local church is to say, I, don't, I, I, I want to be a stone apart from the building. Right? Or to, I want to be a son, but apart from the family. Or to say, I, a refugee away from my home. That's what you're saying as a lone Christian. One that is not married to a local church, in covenant with a local church and a local group of of believers, right? If we are apart from the gathering of Christ's people, we are not following the New Testament pattern and we are not helping ourselves, right? It is not good to be apart from the oversight of shepherds or from the accountability and support of brothers and sisters in Christ. We must have that. We need that. That's what Christ has commanded. That's what the apostles have commanded, right? The New Testament assumes every Christian is part of a local church. It knows nothing of Lone Ranger Christianity or the position that claims, I'm a member of the universal church. I don't need to join a local visible church. I'm a member of the universal church, right? We show that we are a part of the universal church by identifying with the distinct people locally. That's how we identify with the universal church. By universal church, I mean those whom Christ has saved at large all over the world, right? We're identified through the local gathering of God's people. We live out our union with Christ visibly, and we should live out our union with other believers visibly, right? This was an issue in the church. And it can be an issue in churches today, right? In Christ, there is no division. In Christ, we have peace through the cross, through His person and work. In Christ, we are being joined together, praise God, and we can see that. We experience that. God is doing something in our midst, right? And amongst other churches, many times when I come in early in the morning and pray, for what God, that God would be glorified in our gathering, but not only our gathering, but the gathering of God's people all over this world. As, as if you see that picture of all these gatherings of God's people all over the world, proclaiming the word of God and singing to God, I wish we could see what God could see. What a glorious thing. Right? We see... That through the blood, the suffering flesh, the cross and the death of our Lord Jesus Christ, that aliens become citizens. Strangers become family. Idolaters become the temple of the true God. 
The hopeless inherit the promises of God. Those without Christ become one with Him. Those who are far off are brought near. And the godless are reconciled to God. In this text, we see the reconciliation of men to God and men to men. Amen. If you don't know this Christ, I would love it if you come talk to me afterwards. We will sit down and look through the scriptures until until the word is is birthed in you. We must have Christ. Sin separates us from, from God. We need a redeemer. We need one who has satisfied the wrath of God. Right? He will pardon our sin if we will look to Him by faith, if we will believe upon Him, if we will turn away from our sin, if we will put our trust and our faith in the fact that He has satisfied the wrath of God, we will be free. We will be free from our sin. Jesus says that we will inherit eternal life, right? For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son that whoever would believe in Him would not perish, but would have eternal life. And, 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 and to, I think this should be an encouragement to us all. I think this should be a, a, maybe a warning to some of us. Perhaps an encouragement that we are one in Christ, right? And, and that we should pursue our unity in Christ, realizing that it's the blood of Christ that has brought us near. Uh, uh, we were once in a bad shape. We should remember that when we're wrestling with our brother, our sister in Christ, that we should be thankful that there are brother and sister in Christ. Right? We should uh, look past our fleshly differences and be one in Christ. Let's pray. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for your word. I pray that, that you would unite our minds and hearts and as one in you. I thank you for the work that you have done and you're doing in this church. Uh, I, I, I'm so grateful week after week to see the to see the love that that your people have for one another greater and greater, become greater and greater. It's so refreshing to fellowship with your saints, to be of one mind and of one accord. And I'm grateful for that and pray that you would continue to increase our bond in you. I pray that you would continue to work in us through your word uh, uh, to to make this body of believers be a, a, a lighthouse uh, to shine forth brightly the truth of the gospel, uh, to shine forth brightly as, as, as men and women of the word of God. Lord, I pray that you would, that, that you would cause us to, reconcile, to, to recognize our differences and to set them aside and to set them aside if they be of the flesh. Father, we thank you. We love you. I pray that you would bring justification to sinners and that you would sanctify your people in the truth of your word. In Jesus' name, amen.